Were you in the class where we wrote paraphrases? Mm -hmm. This was an assignment where you could write a paraphrase of Colossians. And I'll tell you, some of the things people wrote, they were just wonderful, like where Paul writes that your debt was nailed to the cross and then that very bond was destroyed. Someone wrote, God takes a pencil and, uh, you know, he wrote all our sins, then he turned the pencil around and erased them, and then he threw the tablet away or something. Like, you know, it was just, it just they were trying to get this in. One guy did a whole thing that was like the Wild West. The long arm of the law reached out and that sheriff came. You know, and it was just, it was just. Mine was definitely not <laughs> My name is Dr. Marianne Mai Thompson, and I'm the George Eldon Ladd Professor of New Testament. I'm going to be talking today about Paul's letter to the Colossians. Colossians is a short letter, one of Paul's shorter letters, and it is among the letters we call the prison epistles because it is written while Paul is in prison in Roman custody. The other letters that Paul writes in such circumstances include Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon. Now, we don't know where Paul was in prison when he wrote this. A typical guess for the date of the letter and the place of imprisonment is Rome at the end of Paul's life, which is recounted at the end of the book of Acts. If you think about Paul being in captivity, in prison, and suggest we might suggest that might make him want to write about himself, to tell them about his circumstances, about his captivity, about his imprisonment, what it's like. But in fact, he writes very little about his own captivity. Instead, he writes about what we might call another kind of captivity, a captivity he fears for the Colossians, namely that they will become captive to false views about Jesus, to false teaching about Jesus, to false beliefs about Jesus. And his worry is not that he is captive in a prison cell, but that they will be captive to this false teaching about Christ. And he worries that they are sacrificing Christ's supremacy, Christ's uniqueness, and that they are giving away way too much because they are giving up on the Lordship of Christ over all the world. And so this is a theme that comes through throughout the letter uh, to, the, to the Colossians, that Christ is the one Lord of all. He is God's agent in creation. He is God's agent in the creation of everything that exists so that nothing exists and no one exists that wasn't made by the power of Christ. Not only is Christ the agent of creation, he's the means by which God holds the world together, through which the means through which the world is sustained. So it's not that God made the world through Christ and then just abandoned it or let it go, but that God continues to hold the world together, says Colossians, through the agency of Christ. Christ is also the agent of God's redemption of the world so that everything that is redeemed or reconciled, and that is the whole world for Paul, is done so through the ministry, the work of Christ. So lest you miss the point, there is nothing that exists, there is no one who exists, there is nothing that continues to exist that does not have its life in Christ. So it's interesting in the letter how often Paul uses the little word, all. Christ is the firstborn of all creation. In him, all things were created. He is before all things. In him, all things hold together. All the fullness of God dwells in him. He reconciles all things to himself. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. As Paul sums it up, Christ is all and in all. So Paul says this, using different images. On the one hand, he says, you are rooted in Christ. And on the other hand, he says, you are built up in Christ. So that he encourages the Colossians to sink their roots deeply into Christ, as deep as they can, and to grow their branches high, and to strengthen the core of their being. If, if he imagines that all their life is drawn from Christ, from the roots to the trunk to the branches. That's what he wants for the Colossians. So that every way they turn, whether it's down or up or out, they find themselves living in Christ. So in one of the more memorable statements in the epistle, he writes, he is your life. Christ is your life. He's the life of all the world, but he is your life too. So what follows from that? What follows from Christ's supremacy? 
What is it that this should look like in faith and practice? Paul uses this phrase, you should walk in a way that is worthy of Christ. We might say that's a way of following Jesus. We might say that's a life of obedience. But he talks about something being worthy of Christ, which we might also translate being fit for Christ, apt for who Christ is. Not surprisingly then, Paul's image, his first image, is of death and resurrection. Not only or not even primarily the death and resurrection of Christ, although that is presumed. Instead, Paul says, it works like this. You die with Christ. As he died, we died. But we live with Christ. We live the new life for him. The old life was a way turned away from God. The old life was a way that didn't know Christ. The new life is a way that is oriented towards God. The new life is a way that is lived in Christ, lived with respect to Christ, lived with respect to God. What does that new life from God look like? What is it? What shape does it take besides being Christ-shaped? Paul talks in his letter about several uh, virtues, several practices that tell us what it means to walk worthily of Christ. He talks about living together in the unity of the bonds of Christ and doing so in love, patience, peace, and harmony. Now, what is interesting about these things that Paul names, love, patience, peace, and harmony, is that they are all practiced in relationship to others. Notice Paul does not encourage them to look inward or to seek things for themselves or to try to be better people in and of themselves. He says what it looks like to live worthily of Christ is to live in community with others in love, patience, peace, and harmony. It's not about what I get out of the life of faith, the spiritual high, or experience. It is about what I give to others. It is about the way I live with others. As Paul puts it at one point, it all comes down to love. So let me pull the threads of this together. Colossians is a pretty simple letter if you're talking about its content. It starts with the centrality and supremacy of Christ, and it calls its readers to live in Christ, who is all and in all. And then it moves to talk about what that looks like. And it says what that looks like is living in gratitude to God and in peace with others. So one of the other themes that this letter stresses is gratitude or thanksgiving. If, in fact, Christ is all and in all, if God has given us all things in him, if he is the source of all life, what response is there except that of thanksgiving? And if he is the source of all and in all, then when you look at the other next to you, what response can you make except the kind of response that Christ made to us? Peace, love, harmony, unity. So when you read this letter, watch for all the all words Look and see how many things Christ is said to be over, the things he, the, all the things he is over, or the things that are in him. Look for all the all words, and you'll see something of Paul's sweeping vision of who Christ is. But then notice this too. This vision of Christ doesn't remain a vision up there, ethereal, sort of over all the world, as though it never touches down on earth. This vision of Christ's supremacy is localized, instantiated, not only in the person of Jesus, but in the community. This supremacy of Christ must, live, must be lived out in the way in which we live with each other, in the way we live day to day, in the way we treat each other. We live it out in the way we live with each other. All the power of God in Christ, all the power of Christ in us. And for Paul, that is ultimately the power of love. 